Good morning and happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Uh, so good uh, to have all of you with us on this Thanksgiving Sunday. Uh, and thanks for all of this. Wow. I don't know if the camera can get like a wide shot. Let's show a wide shot. All right, okay, maybe that's as wide as we can go. We got food from corner to corner, uh, and all of this is going into our food bank. Just wanted to say thank you uh, this Thanksgiving for not just feeding yourselves, uh, but for helping feed some, some needy people in and around the Windsor area. All right, we are going to continue on in our teaching series called Build This House. Uh, in case you're new, you might be hopping in. Uh, this week's your first time, so I'll just take a minute just to kind of catch you all up, and then we'll, we'll hit the ground running. Uh, in week one of this series, we just kind of paused and looked at the idea that at one point, yes, it was absolutely true that God's house was physical, uh, tangible. It started with, the, it was called the, the, the tent of meeting, and then it's called the tabernacle, and then later we called the temple. It was, it was a physical location where where God's presence dwells. You had the outer courts, the inner courts, the holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, like the presence of God. It was housed. Uh, and although that was true at a certain point, uh, that's not necessarily true today. Uh, the New Testament clearly teaches that now we are the house of God. Uh, we people, like, like it, it's not brick and mortar, it's flesh and bone. Like, in that week, we just looked at the big picture that Jesus said, I will build my church. I'll build my house, right? He's saying, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That the house that God is building is not necessarily brick by brick. It's person by person. It's, or as First Peter said, it's living stone by living stone, right? That was all week one. And then as we continued on, we said, well, if that's true, that God is building his house, well, it... I think we have to ask the question, well, what type of house does God want to build, right? How many people know there's some unhealthy homes, Amen. right? Like, so we, we don't just want to build, we want to build God's way, like God has preferences. And so it's just, what does the house look like? So the second week we went into and looked at how God wants us to be a house of hope. Last week, uh, how God wants us to be a house of love. And this week, as we move on, we're going to we're going to go on. Today, I believe that God wants us to build a house of faith. Let me hear you say faith. faith. Come on, like you mean it. Say faith. 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 The house of faith. Faith is not a switch that we flip when it suits us best. Faith is not a free ticket to utopia. Faith is not a panic button that we push in times of trouble. Faith is a lifestyle. Like if you actually go on a website, you look at like the core values of this church, what we believe, is this, faith is a lifestyle. It's, it's literally how we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. It's a day-by-day -day thing. It was never meant to be just these, these off moments. Maybe I'll exercise faith next year. No, no it's, it's how we follow Jesus. Jesus. I remember when I was young in Sunday school, and uh, the Sunday school teacher was teaching us how to follow Jesus. And she said this, that, well, she was teaching on Jesus, and said, you know the part where Jesus says that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. Anyone remember that one? Yeah. And then she showed us the size of a mustard seed, and I got really excited. Because I'm like, I have that much faith. I've probably got 10 mustard seeds worth of faith. Like, I can do this. So not long after, my parents took my brother and I, we went to Malden Hill, tobogganing. Uh, if you're new to the city or maybe you're watching online and you don't know what Malden Hill is, it's the mountain of Windsor, okay? We're very flat, Okay, we don't have hills. Malden, and it's not even a real hill. I think it was like a dump at one point that we just put soil over and grass grew. So now kids go sliding down a dump hill. And, and so we're there, we're there. And, and I distinctly remember being a kid down on my knees in front of Malden Hill, praying to God using all my mustard seeds of faith, praying that 
that the mountain would move. It was honestly like a Jedi from like Star Wars, you know, like, like you will move, you know, like, needless to say, it's still there, okay? The mountain didn't move. I remember another time, you guys know, you remember the story of Moses parting the Red Sea? Yeah, I remember being down at the, the Detroit River, and I had a stick. It wasn't a staff like Moses, but I had a stick. And I was determined that if I pray and I put the stick in the water, boom, it's going. So I prayed to God. I, I had about five mustard seeds of faith that day. And I put the stick in the water with, with all the faith that I had. Nothing happened. <laughs> I remember another time. <laughs> Peter, right? Remember Peter walking on water? <laughs> I was like, I can do it. We had a pool in our backyard. It was an above ground with a little deck. And for this one, I wasn't about to do this in front of others. I waited till no one was around. And I walked up on the deck. All the faith that I could muster. And I took that plunge. And I'm proud to say... I sunk like a rock. <laughs> it just, you know what's funny? Actually, after the nine o'clock service, I had two different guys came up to me and said, I did the same thing. I did this. It's just, it's one of those things, right? It's like we, we just, we, we try to exercise that faith. But it begs the question, right? Why didn't it work? Why is Malden Hill still where it's at? Why did the Detroit River not part? Why... Why did I get soaking wet? Actually, not just once. I think I tried it about 15 times, like just <laughs> over and over. Why didn't it work? I want you to hold on to that question, okay? Because by the time that I'm done teaching, hopefully I can actually answer this uh, for us. If you've got a Bible, let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We're going to use one verse as like a diving board, a springboard uh, that's going to kind of set up everything. Romans 10, it's a very important chapter because it actually tells us where faith comes from. Like if we're going to have an honest conversation about faith, we need to actually just, okay, where, where does it start? Well, Romans 10, 17 tells us, says this. So faith comes from hearing in hearing through the word of Christ. I'm going to say this one more time. It's important. We'll all hone in right now. Ready? Faith comes from hearing. In hearing through the word of Christ. Faith doesn't start with me. And it doesn't start with you. Faith starts with God. Okay, uh, the pick, God has a word. God gives a word, and faith is what we decide to do with that word. Are you with me? It's making sense. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, that's the theology point. What I want to do is I want to show you this. I want to I illustrate this for you, like put some meat and bones on it. Uh, today, we're going to look at three stories from the Bible uh, and I am cherry-picking stories. Like, the Bible is full of these stories, but we're going to look at three of them. Uh, go with me out of Romans. We're going to go to the book of Genesis, chapter 6. Story number one, Noah. Remember Noah? He built a boat. That Noah. Let's read some of his story. Genesis 6, go to verse 11. It says, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. Okay, and then in the next few verses in this chapter, God gives very detailed instructions on how to build the boat, right? And, but what's interesting right here with Noah, um, God comes and he says, Noah, first of all, there's a problem. There's a big problem, Noah. Everybody's bad. 
everybody, the, the earth is filled with violence. Nobody is doing the right thing, nobody. So here's what I want you to do, is I want you to build an ark, a big boat, and I want you to get it all set up and I want you to throw some animals in there and you and your family are going to be saved and everybody else is going to die. Honestly, parents in the room, why is this like the first story we teach our kids? It's like, like we, we paint up that ark on the wall and we got all this stuff and like it's very selective what parts of the story we tell, isn't it? My daughter came home from school. She goes to Maranatha. And she says, Daddy, I learned about Noah's Ark today. I was really interested. So I was like, oh, really? She said, yeah, God saved Noah and the people. And I said, oh, interesting. I said, well, what happened to everybody else? She said, well, I said they all just got saved. And I was like, no, that's not a slam on Maranatha. It's just, what are you going to tell a six-year-old? Everybody died, sweetie. Like, no, like... We selectively tell parts of this story, right? It's, this story is one of the most hardcore stories in the Bible. It's, it's one of the most difficult stories to understand. It's, it's real, like, but it, it happened, right? God comes, says, Noah, build a boat. I'm pushing the reset button on humanity. But what I want you to see right now is this, the progression. First, comes the word. Then comes the faith to follow. Look at verse 4, or 22, sorry. The very end of the chapter, it just says this. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Like, Noah didn't come up with the idea of the ark. Noah didn't go to bed one night, have a really weird dream, and the next morning start cutting down trees. It's not what happened. Faith doesn't start with us, it starts with God. God had a word for Noah, right? And the faith that Noah exercised was actually building the boat. And it worked. It worked. The rain came, the flood rose, and the boat floated, right? And their family was saved. And, and, and then they, they, they land on dry ground. The flood started to, you know, go back into the ground and all that kind of stuff. And... And, and all of a sudden, it's like, well, maybe this time humanity is going to get it right. Wrong. Do you remember, like, one of the first things Noah does? Plants a vineyard, gets hammered drunk on his own wine, and passes out naked? It's like, yeah, we're not telling our toddlers that part. <laughs> you know? Like, but this is the story. This is the story. Now, what I love about God is God is so unbelievably gracious. And in here, he's determined, right? This is where we get the rainbow from. It's like God's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done with the destruction thing, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to work with my people. And so he says, Noah, first of all, put some clothes on. <laughs> just, just throw on a cloak, do something. And he says, all right, we got to repopulate the earth. I'm not done with you yet. And then you can actually track this. You go through the bloodline of Noah. Eventually, we hit a guy named Abraham. This is story number two. Remember Abraham? Yep. Had many sons? Yep. And many sons? Had father Abraham? Come on, say it with me. And I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm. Dun, dun, dun. I don't know how that song goes. It's been a long time. That guy. We're talking about that guy. We sing a song about how many sons Abraham had. But you got to remember where it all started. There was a point in the story when Abraham had no sons. And God comes and he brings this word, Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 2. Now the Lord said to Abram, Abram, Abraham, same guy. He says, go from your country and your kindred in your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. This is good. This is, this is Abraham's word. God comes to him and says, Abraham, get out of here. Go. Leave behind everything you know. And if you just... 
walk, then here's what's going to happen. I'm going to bless you and your family. Through your bloodline, Abraham, there is going to be a nation that is going to bless the entire world. That's a good word. So what does Abraham do? Right? Look at verse 4. It says, So Abram went as the Lord had told him. God says, Abraham, trust me. Have faith. You and your wife are going to have a child. Now, there's a couple problems with God's word here. There's a couple. Number one, this is important, God didn't give Abraham a map at all. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 will look back on this story and say, yeah, Abraham went. He didn't even have a sweet clue where he was going. It's the Danny Gray version, by the way. God didn't give him any directions. He just said, walk. And if you walk, if you trust me, if you have faith, I will bless you. That's the first problem. No map, no direction. The second problem is this. Abraham and Sarah were in their mid-70s at this point. And Sarah spent her entire life being barren. She can't have children. That's a long time, right? Eventually, at a certain point, you just kind of give up on the dream of ever having a child. But the word that God gave is if you walk, if you go, if you have faith, then then here's what's going to happen through your bloodline. Abraham, Sarah, you're going to have a child. Elderly past childbearing years, bear, and there's so many problems with this. If you walk, you will have your child. And Abraham has great faith. He literally leaves everything that he knows. He leaves his father, he leaves his kindred, he leaves everything, and he walks aimlessly, saying, God, all right, I trust you. I believe that you're going to work. And and what I love about Abraham is if you know the story, yes, he exercised great faith in this moment by walking. But as you know, like when the story goes on, they, they, they heard the word from the Lord. They followed the word from the Lord, but God didn't deliver right away. They were in their mid 70s when the word came. They would go a long time and Sarah still could not have a child. Years would go on. And eventually, Sarah just gave up. And Sarah came up with a really bad idea. Sarah says, well, Abraham, clearly this is not working. I don't know if we misheard God or he's not able, but I have this younger friend. Why don't you sleep with her And you can have your child that way. And Abraham, like a moron, says, okay. (laughs) It's like, I can have faith for that. You know, like, like just, (laughs) you know the story, right? This, This absolutely like blows up their relationship. It's really, really bad. But because God is gracious, And because God is kind, he does not give up on Abraham, right? He he comes back and he says, Abraham, let's talk again, okay? You're not going to have, I I don't want you sleeping with all these different women. You You need to have faith. Get in the bedroom with your wife, not some other woman, and make a baby. That's God's word. And so Abraham had the faith to believe again. And get this, when they conceived, Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 90. That's crazy. Like, that's absolutely crazy. But first, see the progression, okay? First comes the word of God. Then comes the faith to follow. Are are you with me this morning? All right, so that's two out of three stories. You have one more in you? Okay. Let's flip over New Testament style. Get out of Genesis. We're going to go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 14. Here we're going to read a uh, very popular story. Uh, It's the story of Jesus and Peter uh, when they, they walk on water. I was kind of alluding to it earlier. 
Uh, if you don't know, the Sea of Galilee uh, is not a very big sea. Um, actually, like, yeah. What, what's, that, what's that lake right near us? Not Lake Erie, the other one. Lake St. Clair. Lake St. Clair is bigger than the Sea of Galilee. Um, like, like, the Sea of Galilee, not, not really all that big. And, uh, but Jesus comes to his disciples, and he gives them a word. He says, all right, I want you to, uh, I need you guys to get in a boat, and I want you to cross over to the other side. That's the original word that they were given. And uh, Jesus, this time, does not get in the boat with them. Right? He stays back, does some praying, does some Jesus stuff. And then uh, a storm hits. And it's a bad storm. See, if, if you have to understand the geography to really understand what's happening here. The Sea of Galilee kind of sits a little bit low, and you got these like mountain ranges that kind of wrap around it. So the wind, these violent storms would come off these mountains. They would collide with one another, creating like this circular kind of windstorm. And if you're in the middle of it, you get stuck. The, the disciples are stuck. These are seasoned fishermen who grew up on this body of water and they're stuck. They cannot navigate their way through. They're, they're, they're not figuring it out. They're fighting the storm. And then this happens. Matthew 14, we'll pick it up in verse 25. It says, about three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them walking on the water. You know what our problem is? We've heard this story so many times, there's no like collective gasp anymore. Okay? Jesus walks on water. I know. <gasps> That's the appropriate response. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost. <laughs> All right, so Jesus comes to them in the middle of a storm in the middle of the lake, and uh, he's not in a boat. Jesus, this time, he's, he's, not, he's not riding up on a jet ski, right? Like, he's walking on water. Like, I'm walking on a stage. Jesus is walking on water, and they're terrified, absolutely terrified, and so would you be if you were there. They're terrified. They, they cry out, it's a ghost. Why? Because no human being can possibly do what he's doing. Jesus, like this is a miracle of God. In case you don't know, humans sink when we try to walk on water. Jesus, walking on water, they're afraid, they're terrified. They think that he's a ghost, and it goes on. Verse 27, but Jesus spoke to them at once and said, don't be afraid. He said, take courage, I'm here. Then Peter called to him and said, Lord, if it's really you, watch this now. He said, tell me to come to you walking on the water. I find that fascinating. <laughs> I really do. You ever wonder, like, what a strange thing to ask Jesus for in that moment? You've been fighting a storm for hours. You're exhausted. You probably thought you are going to die several times. And all of a sudden, Jesus is there. And, and Peter, he, he doesn't say, Jesus, fix my situation. That's how we pray. Jesus does, you know, Peter doesn't say, Jesus, if it's you, if it's really you, Lord, could you please calm the storm? Jesus, if it's you, could you please calm the wind and the waves? We're tired, we're exhausted, we've been in this for so long, can you just remove it? It's not, it's not what he says. He says, Lord, if it's you, give me a word. Because Peter is smart enough to know Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Peter, like, like Peter walking out in the middle of a storm, trying to walk on water apart from the word of Christ, that's not faith, that's stupidity. But Peter knows if he just gives me a word, 
if he just, if he just calls me out to him, I have everything that I need. He said, I'm not moving unless he calls me. Lord, if it's you, I need to hear your voice. I need you to call me out on the water. I love verse 29. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and he walked on water toward Jesus. First, first comes the word of Christ. Then comes the faith to follow. The progression matters tremendously. We have to understand, if we're going to talk about being a house of faith, we have to understand that uh, we're not a church that assumes. We're not a church that presumes. We're a church that hears. You understand the difference? We're not... We're not walking blindly. We're, we're, we're discerning the voice of God. God, would you speak? God, would you, would, you, would you say what you need to say? And Lord, would we have ears to hear what you would want to say to your church? Because it is only then, it is only when we hear that we actually can have faith. It's only then. So you say, okay, well, well, well how does God speak? How do we know the voice of God? Well, I'm going to give you two like big ways. There's many, but here, here's two big ones. First of all, God speaks through his word. Okay, primarily God speaks through his word. Okay? See, we get into trouble sometimes as charismatics because we like what comes next. Let me just, primarily God speaks through his word. First Peter, I think it's 3.16, says that this, what I'm holding in my hands right now, this is the theos nustos of God. It is God's breath. It is, this, this is not just ink on paper. This, this is God's great exhalation towards humanity. If you want to hear the voice of God, read his word. Like, this is the primary way that he speaks, but it is not the only way that he speaks. God also speaks to us through the indwelling presence of his spirit. In the spirit of God, that when we said yes to Jesus, that came and lives inside of us, that, that same spirit, he has a unique word for me and he has a unique word for you. God is speaking. Do you want to know, like it's Thanksgiving. You want to know what I'm thankful for? <laughs> Number one, I'm thankful that God still speaks. Anybody thankful this Thanksgiving that God still speaks? He has a unique word for you and for me, which let's go back to my opening stories, okay? Why didn't it work? Why did I sink like a rock? It's actually pretty simple because God didn't give me the word. God didn't call me out on the water. <laughs> How about this? Because I was copying the faith act of somebody else. The reality is God didn't call Danny Gray to be Peter. He called me to be Danny Gray. And he called you to be you. And the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us, speaks to us. Listen, I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what season you're in, high or low, but, but I can guarantee you this. God is speaking to you right now. Right now. Maybe you're not listening. Maybe you don't like what he's saying. So you're waiting for a better word in your mind. <laughs> The better word is the one he's giving. God still speaks. And so much of the Christian faith and so much of the Christian journey is over time learning how to discern the voice of the Spirit. And that's like a muscle. 
It's a muscle that like the more that we exercise it, the, the more that it grows. The more that you, that you spend time in the word and spend time in prayer through the spirit, the more that you will begin to understand God's voice when he speaks. It's a muscle we, we need to hear. So the first thing this Thanksgiving, I'm thankful that God still speaks. And here's the second thing. I'm thankful that God doesn't give up on us when we just miss it. <laughs> I'm thankful that God is gracious and kind and slow to anger with Danny Gray. Like, Noah, build a boat. That's your word. He has faith. He builds the boat. He does it. And then he passes out drunk, naked. Not so good, Noah. And God's like, all right, I'm not giving up on you. Get up. Let's go. Abraham, here's your word. You need to walk and you need to go make a baby with your elderly wife. And he walks and he walks, but then it doesn't come in the timing that they thought. So he sleeps with another woman. And God's like, come on, man. No, I've already given you the word. It's Sarah. You're going to have a baby through Sarah. I'm not giving up on you yet. How about Peter? <laughs> Peter gets one word come. And he walks on water. At least for a little bit. All right, you know the story? Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus and onto the wind and the waves. And the moment that he took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink like a rock. And what does Jesus do? Fold his arms and say, well, Pete, enjoy the long swim back home. You really messed this one up. No. He picks him up, <laughs> gets him back in the boat. I'm not giving up on you. He doesn't give up on Noah. He doesn't give up on Abraham. He doesn't give up on Peter. I thank God that he hasn't given up on Danny Gray yet because I've had some good moments and I've also had some really embarrassing moments. Anybody with me? Can we just be honest this Thanksgiving? Like, God is gracious. And I'm thankful, I'm thankful that he's still moving and speaking to his church. Can we stand up all across this room? Listen, as we close, I just want to ask a very important question. Every eyeball, every earball, right here. What's your word? What is God speaking to you? What's, what's the water that he's calling you to walk out onto? What's your word? Maybe your word... <laughs> maybe, maybe this morning your body, you're just riddled with some sort of disease, some sort of infirmity, and you've just given up hope that God can do it. And maybe the word for you this morning is have faith. The Bible says that God is our healer. And it says to believe in faith for the healing. So maybe today, maybe that's the word that God's just coming and saying, I am your healer. Trust me, walk with me. Don't give up your hope in me. Maybe the word that God has for you today is that there's somebody in your life, neighborhood, workplace, uh, whatever it is, in your family, maybe the word is love the unlovable. That one that nobody else goes to. Maybe the word, and you felt it, you have felt the Spirit say, would you just go and be my hands and my feet? Maybe the word for you is that. And the faith is to actually get up and walk across the room. Maybe the word that God has for you this morning is something like radical generosity. <laughs> Like God has put something on your heart in a way and, and you're terrified by it. And you have no clue how it's going to come through. And God's, he's spoken the word. It's up to you now to decide, do you have faith to follow? Maybe the word 
that God is speaking today. Maybe the water that he's calling you out onto is to actually believe in him for the very first time. Maybe you've, it's the faith to believe. And if that's you this Thanksgiving Sunday, I just want to tell you there is no better decision that you will ever make in your life other than to put your faith in Jesus Christ. No better decision. What's your word? What's Jesus calling you into? What's the scary thing that doesn't make sense to you right now, but you feel God's voice in it? Will you stay in the boat? Will we just continue to ask God, fix the situation, calm the storm? Or will we actually look at him and say, God, I just need to hear the word from you. God, speak to me. What's your word? Church, we need to hear the word. We need to follow the word. We need to have faith. Faith comes by hearing in hearing through the word of Christ. So may we be a house of faith, not a house of presumption or assumption, not a house that blindly walks around. May we be a house of faith. Amen?